Good evening, everybody. We are here in Star at Costco and Votes for a fun, it's a very intimate setting here, but I love it. It's going to be a really great, great event. So, and twice for folks who are online, welcome, welcome to Best Boys and Votes Books Presents. We're so excited to be hosting you guys here. We hope that you guys are going to tune in the next few minutes. I know we got started maybe like a few 30 seconds late, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. We are so, so pleased to be able to host Ms. Hannah B. Sawyer in conversation today with Sadia Rashi. All right. So, Sadia Bashir is a poet, is poet and freelance writer. She took to poetry as a means of self-expression to then becoming a two-time youth Grand Slam champion. Her poetry has been showcased for media outlets such as Al Jazeera and commissioned by Apple and Honey Appeal. Okay, okay. <laughs> her, uh, her articles have been published by the Independent, Where Your Voice Might Be Missed Them, and as I newsletter. Her debut book, entitled Seven, is where she explores her life through writing from adolescence to the present day. And for a lady of the hour, Miss Kennedy Sawyer was recognized as the Youth Poet Laureate of Baltimore in 2016. Her spoken word has been featured on the BBC's World High Your Say program, as well as the National Education Association's Do You Hear Us campaign. Her written word has been included in Galvin, Rippy, and XO Nicole. She holds a BA in English from Melbourne State University and an MFA in Creative Writing from the New School. Oh, we can see. She is an English professor currently at Loyola Marymount University and lives in Los Angeles, California. All the fighting parts is a lady novel. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the Let's Go Go Around the Club. Courtroom, he is R.J. 
accused, but still innocent until proven guilty. My father watches as a member of the courtroom, bracing himself to hear the fate of the man he once called friend. Often, I catch myself daydreaming of ways to seek revenge on him, perhaps shooting him, burning his home, mimic the way he burned the home inside of me, mimic the way my father burned on the inside the night I told him our living room filled with smoke. I settle for time in this courtroom, marvel at its eeriness, try concentrating on my breathing, but the air is thick here, as if the presence of untold truths fill the room to its capacity, my stomach begins to feel as weak as an abuser's apology. I convince myself this is just a conversation, a spirited debate. I am only answering questions everyone thinks they know the answer to. The first few questions are the easiest. What is your date of birth? What school do you attend? What is your current city of residence? And even those questions make my heart jump right out of my chest and into the middle of this courtroom. Testifying against your abuser is a lot like a Sunday morning service. The audience is a congregation ready for a word. The judge and the jury are Jesus and his disciples waiting to hear all of our sins. And Johnson is at an altar begging for forgiveness. For survivors, the courtroom is meant to be a place of justice, a sanctuary of healing, an opportunity to take back what the defendant stole. Testifying is like saying your most desperate prayer on a night when everyone in the world or the courtroom can hear you. I am asked to recall the night of December 19th. On this judgment day, I open my mouth and testify to everything that has tried to end me, everything that has tried to silence me, everything that has tried to make a mess of my body. for so long, and um, so one of the huge differences between Amina and I, Amina sees a uh, trial in about 11 months, which is not realistic for a lot of people. <laughs> they say you can get away with one thing that's not very realistic in fiction, and I think that's probably the biggest <laughs> thing that's not realistic in this book. Um, but I remember when I was um, being interrogated, uh, my abuser's attorney I got that poem published in an anthology, and it was a super small anthology. It had maybe like 300 copies. Um, and I remember he brought out his, his bag, he bought the copy, and he said, did you write anything in this? And it was baseless, and it didn't mean anything, but it really scared me. And so I didn't write for a very long time after that. Um, and so for me, I like to start with that piece just because I feel like it's me being able to reclaim a story and a poem that meant so much to me at a time and that I felt like was like used against me and almost taken mm -hmm. away from me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's rewritten slightly so that it's a mean situation, but um, it, it means quite a lot to me to be able to um, perform that poem without fear. So I'd like to start with that one. <laughs> All right, the next piece I'm gonna read, there's this boy in all the fighting parts, his name is Volka, and he, <laughs> Volka, he gets on his nerves. Um, if y'all know the show, uh, Nancy Classified School Survival Guide, um, if you can imagine <laughs> Coconut Head, he looks like Coconut Head, but blonde, and probably Coconut Head's evil twin, uh, because he's not so nice. Um, a question that I get quite a lot with all the fighting parts is about Amina's personality. I wrote her in a way, she's very much so loud and proud, she gets herself into trouble. And we see that in the very beginning of the book. And I, I wrote her that way because I remember when I came forward, I had a couple of people who asked me how something like that could happen to me because I was a very loud uh, teenager. I got myself into trouble. I was talking back quite a lot. And I wrote her this way because I wanted to prove that one didn't matter and that we should be protecting all children, no matter who they are, or, you know, how they present, or if they seem like they can protect themselves. But also, 
Um, I wanted to write her this way because I wanted to challenge adults to protect um, children, regardless of who they are. Um, so I'm going to start with this piece called uh, Bull Cut. Um, I'm sorry for the cussing. My dad's in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> naming decides to talk shit. I call him Bull Cut because he's been rocking the same tired ass bull shaped haircut since preschool. <laughs> bull Cut whispers in a not so quiet way, letting the whole room know he wants to be heard. Do they let anyone in these classes now? Page birth. Anyone walking in my, in my shoes would understand why Bull Cut want to be history with should have shut his not so smart ass mouth. Anyone would understand why I respond by saying, you don't have to act out because your mom's been giving you the same tired ass haircut since pre paid bowl cut. Anyone in my position would understand why bowl cut should have quit while he was ahead. Instead, he says, I think Amina is grappling with the idea that she doesn't have to take everything so personally. Anyone would understand why I respond by throwing a highlighter I probably borrowed from him while words flew right out of my mouth, like I am a caged bird. But instead of learning how to sing, I learned how to holler. I think this asshole is grappling with the fact that I don't give a fuck. Like, that's exciting to me. 
Um, one thing that I did incorporate were comment sections, and that it's not it's not a funny part in the book, but that was funny to write because you know how people act in comment sections; they act in mass. It was super um, cool for me to be able to incorporate those different sorts of mixed media. And honestly, I don't think I'll ever stop doing that. It's just it's simply fun <laughs> to do. It is. It's really. It's very fun to read. Um, so, considering that that is something that is like really exciting to you, what was the least exciting part of writing this? Honestly, I think um, there are a lot. Writing, <laughs> <laughs> right? I, it's something I love. It's something I'm passionate, I'm passionate about, but it's not always fun. I think for me, my least favorite parts of this book were really the parts that forced me to go to places where I did not want to go. Um, so there's a um, there's a scene I don't want to spoil it. It's the scene where the assault takes place. It's not on the page, but it still was incredibly emotional for me to write because even though I'm not describing the assault itself, I still have to describe how she's feeling in that moment and how you know how she reacts to that. So those were parts that were a little bit harder, and those were parts that I had to be very gentle with myself. Um, the final four scenes in the book and the assault scene, I think I was editing up until the end because I couldn't handle editing it um, at one time. Specifically, the court scene is actually, um, and I'm very thankful I had an editor who um, very kindly, uh, I know actually it was my editor's assistant who very kindly wrote a note about how the final court scene seemed a little thin. And so I ignored it up until the very end and I actually handed it in without really expanding on those court scenes. And I emailed her after the fact and was like, okay, can you give me like a week and I will address that now. And that was where past pages and you're not supposed to add pages to past pages. It's like <laughs> the last step. And um, she let me do it, which I'm very, very thankful for, but I almost didn't do it because it was, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. Powerful. And I feel like as writers, um, we all kind of have that experience, especially like, I think this is another way in which like coming from a coaching community has kind of prepared us for that level of like giving yourself a grace um, in regards to writing about these types of topics. No, absolutely. I like, what you, I like that. I think my background in this book is what allows me to have grace during those moments. And I think that's because of the support of folks around me. And I feel like I'm always reminded to give myself grace. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that. Yeah. Charlie yeah. around grace and community and stuff like that. I mean, has a lot of community um, in this book. And so it's actually very inspiring to read. And so what was kind of like your inspiration to make sure that she had that level of community? I. I knew that all the fighting parts, one would be a really tough read, right? Like, I'm hoping that it helps people, but I do know like the, the sense of you know nature of the content, and so it was really important to me for Amina to have a community that lifts her up. Um, in fact, in the earlier drafts of the book, one of my editor's notes was that the community needs a little bit more nuance because they showed up for her in a way that was slightly unrealistic. <laughs> um, yeah, I have one of I have only one. You only have one. Um, and so that was kind of my challenge, is giving them more human qualities, like allowing them to mess up. And I think they're always, they always have good intentions, right? But they're still human beings, and so they don't always show up in the ways that I mean needs. And on the other hand, I think Amina has to learn how to show up for her people as well. Um, and I think that's a lesson that she learned towards the end, is that she could have been a better uh, person to the folks around her too. I mean, it's totally understandable, you know, right? Her girl, she goes through it. Um, but I think she also learned that she also needs to be an active member of her community and good to people as well. And there's also a crush. A little bit of a love interest, right? Like, which is typical of like young adult novels, having like a crush, a love interest. But considering what it is that she went through, and like the stigma, especially on black women, like being fast and things like that, were 
you ever hesitate about adding any kind of love interest? Not at all. Um, I mean, I needed my things. <laughs> she really goes through it. Um, I know the book just came out, so not a book has read it just yet. But once you do, you'll know what I mean when I say she. She really does go through the ringer, and I needed her to have just a very nice and sweet romance. And even that relationship isn't perfect either. Really? Um, that that's a complicated relationship too. Um, but. I think he genuinely cares for her, and I think that's just something that I wanted her to have. I just thought she deserved that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this question, I'm stealing from TikTok because um, I follow you on TikTok, and I'm oh my sure. God, really? Yes. <laughs> so down and I would be so hard on myself 
Um, but one of the things that I wrote in Multiplying Course that I really want people to understand, there's a, another person who experiences something similar to Amina in the book, who chooses a very different path than Amina. And when they have that conversation, I might just misquote myself here. I'm going to try for a lot more than a book. But um, it's right. She's just like, <laughs> uh, the line is, she's a fighter and she fought because she survived. And for me, when I think about uh, survival, I think I always thought that it needed to look a certain way. But I think the truth of the matter is like, a lot of the times it's literally just being able to wake up and that's all I could do. And that's all that's gonna happen today. <laughs> and that's, a, that's okay to me. took my first word that I was going to talk about um, to read, but there's another part, um, and it's actually, um, so this part kind of talks about being voiceless, but it's more so Amina's perspective um, of her father being voiceless. Um, it's entitled, We Do Not Speak. That night, my father asked me to do dishes by pointing to the used ones in the sink without speaking. Tells me he is proud of the A essay I leave on the counter with a head nod and half a smile without speaking. Tells me rice and stew are ready on the stove by making his own plate for dinner without speaking. How can he listen when all he's ever known is the never ending silence? I do not know why I expect it to be heard by a man who knows silence better than he knows his pastor or a loved one, even his daughter. That was a hard passage to write too. I mean, it's it's very powerful, right? And and it speaks to a lot of things because when I read that, I thought of all the ways in which, like, you know, our parents kind of speak love into us without necessarily saying "I love you." So when she talks about like without even speaking, you wouldn't know like, "Hey, let's meet the table." Like, let's go eat something. Um, so kind of give me an idea as to like the relationship between Nina and her father and like where that inspiration came from. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um so Amina Amina only has her father in the home. Before the book passes before the book starts, Amina's mom has passed and she's an only child. And in the book Amina's father struggles with what happens to her because he looks up to Pastor Johnson so much. And Amina struggles with the fact that she feels like her dad is silent and doesn't protect her the way that she believes her mom would have. Um, I wrote all the fighting parts very, very loosely on my experience. Um, and in the book, one of the things that Amina wrestles with is her relationship with her father, and they end up okay. But, and I'll speak to my dad's in the audience, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> me and my dad are like this, by the way. <laughs> no, okay, so I'm yeah. probably all like, we locked in, we locked in. My dad didn't respond the way that Amina's father responds in the book, but as, just like Amina's relationship with her dad grows, my relationship with my dad had to grow as well. Um, and there were things that we needed to talk about in order to get like this. Um, and so I think one of the things that Amina really, really wrestles with, and her father really, really wrestles with, is the fact that they do care about each other, but they don't know how to show the other person that they care about each other in a way that they can receive. Okay, so this is gonna be my last question, then we're gonna put this in the floor for Q&A. You're doing so good. Thank you. I love it. I from the view. So one of the things for me, this is obviously a question for me personally, not for anybody else, but one of the hard parts for writing about things that are very close to home for me is kind of like this idea of like how are some of these people going to handle it, right? Like we just talked about like your relationship with your father and how it differs from 
you know, Alina and her relationship with her father, but still, you know, folks can read things into it and kind of like, oh, it's, you know. And so how do you deal, like, with those kinds of perceptions and how do you deal with writing things that are very close to home and, and allowing the world to just have it? Oh, that's a really good question, <laughs> especially because everyone in the mother thinks that all the fighting parts are more. Um, and that is because I've been so open about the fact that, I mean, and I do have a lot of similarities, and we do have a lot of similar experiences. Um, but this is something that my class actually said. I talked to my dad about this book before it, it came out. Um, and he told me that I need to write a story that needs to be written. And I hold that really close to my book. <laughs> Like a lot of people don't like Amina's dad, and I get it because Amina's dad does not make great decisions. And because I've been open about the fact that this is loosely based on my experiences, I was really afraid that my pops would think that that character was based on him, so that it was important for me to have that conversation. But once he said that, I felt like very free to tell the stories that I, I need to tell. And I think. If I'm being honest, I think the person who I snitched on the most is me. I think the person <laughs> that is most like anybody in this book is Amina to me. But her community is very, very different than the community that I had. Like, her best friend Talia, I didn't have a Talia in my life. So there's no one who could be like, you wrote Talia baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was actually based on me, but I granted I had that kind of years later through <laughs> You know what? You actually are kind of similar to Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> you have Tyler's energy. Um, I didn't have the be on. As a matter of fact, I mean, this book really is a memoir because Amina has a great love life and mine sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I No one else is more of a direct match than you know. <laughs> Like, 
as a, uh, I'm sorry. Um, like, yeah, why did you give her a love interest considering what you wanted to say in the story? That's a good question. Okay, so the question was, why did you give her, <laughs> why did you give her a love interest considering what, what it does say in the story? I just, I wanted her to have a very sweet thing. And Dion is a very sweet guy to her. Um, I felt like she just deserved that. I also wanted to show that, um, like, it's possible because I think a lot, well, this was my experience. When I experienced what I experienced, I thought, like, I just was not, like, worthy of, like, a sweet love. And it, it really messed with a lot of my relationship. <laughs> Um, and so I think I was writing what I think Amina deserved and also what I think I deserve. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> I have to get my girls to feel surprised. Oh, yeah. I am actually really not looking. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm stressed. I don't have time. You're just being touring this book around. <laughs>
I also challenged myself to write it by hand because I found that uh, the first draft. <laughs> 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 I typed it. Oh, okay. I typed it. Oh, okay. So you wrote it and you like. Yeah. Wow. But when you were writing it by hand, I was like, oh my goodness, I know that's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I typed it. And this is 38,000 words, so Ooh. not not the same. Wow. But challenging myself to write the first draft because that was a very thin first draft in 30 days forced me to constantly be in the story. Mm. So even if you don't finish it in 30 days, I think it's a good challenge because you're like, okay, well, I'm trying to write this in 30 days. Let me sit and write this page on my lunch break. Let me, you know. And then after that, you approach it. And it might be really messy, but you have something solid to work with. And hopefully, you've got those gears turning so it's easier. And also, one of the biggest changes is also the change of the name, right? You want to talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. I thought it was actually maybe something else. What kind of yeah, it was on my name. Yeah, it was on my name. But there's this little book called Call Me By Your Name. You might have heard of it. <laughs> It's like, it was like, 
fighting in, in bold and red. <laughs> so sometimes you gotta be thankful for people on your team who can tell you when you are making a bad decision. Community. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Is there any more questions? No. Well, thank you so much, Brian. so much for tuning in to Bus Boys of Hope Books Presents. We had a lovely evening with the both of you and Nina because, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great night.